Welcome to Unique People Stories. Thoughts about differences between classes. As a former working class person now sort of lower middle class, I think I have had myriad experiences with people from all classes ranging from working class to upper class. My opinions are highly subjective so I apologize if they come across as generalizations. Middle class people have an excessive need to appear more patrician than they really are. In the workplace and in higher education they correct you, talk over you, ignore you or dominate you. They are confident. They almost always name their children a classic Victorian name such as Florence, Christopher, Iris, Thomas etc. Their houses are almost always period properties with fireplaces and original features. In the workplace, they are very professional. As if they were born speaking like that and born with those manners. The modern office, school, hospital, courtroom is like their natural habitat. They are very objective and sometimes harsh in how little they care about people's personal circumstances and resort to logic and rhetoric. But also, some of the nicest people I know are middle class. They are mild mannered, polite, liberal, and quite enlightened. They don't show extreme emotions such as anger, which makes them seem easygoing. As Lindsay Hanley states, the middle class speak English with fluency. They are used to being listened to and they speak in a commanding way. They also speak in a way that is universal and standard. By this, I mean that they can be understood by everyone because they speak objectively and logically, assuming that the other person doesn't necessarily know what one is talking about. So they elaborate and talk precisely and accurately. They can make the most ordinary thing seem very clever and original just by talking with an RP accent. They feel like they can do anything that they set their minds to, and they are usually correct in that assumption because the world likes people like them. A big factor of middle-class children speaking confidently and eloquently is the way they are raised. Middle-class parents bring up their children according to the method of concerted cultivation. This involves talking to children about current affairs and a broad range of topics the way you would speak to a grown-up. It means treating them as an individual. It means getting them to do lots of extracurricular activities like sports, drama, music, chess, a language. It means identifying a child's potential and helping them explore it. The children often spend a lot of time with expert adults and have more supervised activities, which give them skills in speaking with adults as their equals. They learn how to speak clearly, confidently, using subtle and detailed concepts and they learn to negotiate, to appropriately challenge authority. They get taught how to speak to waiters in a restaurant, how to explain their medical problems to a doctor, how to ask their teacher for more homework, etc. Upper class people seem really interesting to me because often, they can be more eccentric and unique because they don't really need to fit in the way the middle class do. They speak with an RP accent too but it's a bit posher than the middle class RP accent. I once interviewed to work as a nanny for a family who were real princes and princesses because they were Croatian royalty and the wife was from a Jewish banking family. They lived in a three-bedroom house in a very posh part of central London. But their house was kind of shabby. There were photos of the various travels they had embarked on. Their children didn't have names like Henrietta or Rupert. Instead, they had foreign names that sounded weird in English, so weird that they sounded great because they were unique. I noticed that I was more ostentatiously dressed than they were. I had aimed to look posh and professional and they were wearing old but good quality and elegant clothes. Upper class people in the UK tend to wear a lot of wool, cotton, silk and other natural fabrics. They like the countryside and traditions. For some reason, they are almost always slim. But there was something I really liked about them. They made me feel like a unique human being. Probably because that's how they saw themselves and the feeling was reflected on to me. Unfortunately, I didn't hear back from them about the outcome of the interview and I became annoyed. I realized how little they thought about others and weren't used to thinking about the feelings of underlings. They were self-absorbed in a different way to the middle class. They were otherworldly. As if they spent all their time thinking about esoteric things within the finance world. There was something organic and natural about them and while they came across as lovely people, there lurked something dark behind that pleasant exterior, maybe there was nothing unpleasant there at all. But their thoughts were very inaccessible. They lived such private lives. In the UK, it is very rare to befriend someone of a different class. All of my friends have ranged from working class to middle class but not above. When I lived abroad for three years though, it was different. In Turkey, I had an upper middle class friend who seemed out of this world. She was so beautiful and glamorous. Her whole life was a work of art. She spent most of her time in bohemian cafes and would have affairs with risky men. 
all the while married to a good but less attractive rich man. She was like Madame Bovary or Belle du Jour. For her, money was never a topic. She would eat out and drink in cafes all the time but never found it special because it was an everyday occurrence. She enjoyed eating ordinary and plain food at home. Food that was very expensive and organic. But simple stuff. She took herself quite seriously. Her way of dressing. Her manners and her speech were all very exquisite. Like in the song, Killer Queen, by Queen or Peter Sarsets, Where Do You Go to My Lovely? She laughed often but never actually joked about anything. I have noticed that upper middle class and upper class people don't joke about sex or bodily functions. It seems that they don't joke much because they are quite serious. Some of the best comedians come from a working class or middle class background. Finally, the working class. Working class often people experience a lot of stress and uncertainty about the basic things in life such as shelter, food, utilities, health, as such. They seem to be carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders because they are more vulnerable to exploitation. Granted, we don't have this level of poverty on a large scale anymore but it does exist. Especially since the austerity cuts to public services. The working class are fiercely loyal to their friends and community. They are usually less likely to get ahead because of class loyalty. They have a collective identity and are less individualistic. Often they have a fatalistic approach to life. Due to inheriting all the latent worries of previous generations or due to having many disadvantages that hold them back. They often have self-fulfilling prophecies about themselves. Imagine if you were so poor that you didn't have any toys. Enough food to eat or frequently became ill because your house was cold or unsanitary. You'd be living but not thriving. Being working class is about being pushed this way or that by forces outside of your control. The world is very cruel to those who don't have too much money. After a while. You start to internalize this and begin to think that, at your core, you are not worthy of anything good because the feedback you get from the world seems to confirm this. They name their children very cuddly names like Molly, Rosie, Ryan, Sean etc. They are warm and loving towards their kids, often hugging them and dressing them in cute clothes that are gender specific. This is because they like certainty, comfort and family. Their wealth comes from family and community connections because they usually lack financial capital this isn't the case with families who have businesses in the trade sector such as construction, plumbing etc. Such people are quite affluent. They also show more extreme emotions and swear a lot compared to the other classes. They are more straight talking and honest. The working class speak English in a native but non-fluent way. Their speech is much more particular and less universally understood and only those within the class or social group will understand. They have their own linguistic subculture with its own grammar and lexical features. It is worth noting that in the past, the vast majority of people were poor and therefore it was mainstream. You could be poor and respectable at the same time. It was only in the late 70s and 80s when coal mines and heavy industry started shutting down and moving overseas that the traditional working class no longer had any means of supporting themselves or a secure identity. That's when they had to rely on welfare, instead of being a productive part of society. The working class became what Marx refers to as the reserve army of surplus workers, which in Marx's time referred to the homeless, drunkards, prostitutes and other members of the Lumen proletariat. These were the people who were ready to take on jobs if there were any strikes from the existing workers. Except, something a bit different happened. These new members of the Lumen proletariat became over-reliant on welfare and stopped participating in the workforce for many different reasons. Chief among them was that the wage they would earn from working a full-time would still keep them in poverty if they were unskilled workers or those lacking in self-esteem so they continued living on welfare as a lifestyle. There are distinct social graces or mannerisms that come only with upper class, largely because the environment in which one acquires them is an upper class environment and they are acquired early in life. An example is knowing instinctively the order of conversation at a formal dinner, how to use silverware and how to use the various plates, how to eat bread. If I'm in a restaurant I generally can't tell if the people at an adjacent table are wealthy or not, but if I watch them eat or interact with the waiter I can generally identify their class. A well-modulated voice. Devoid of too much emotion. Kindness to other people. Relating to service and staff in the proper manner. With respect. We don't put people down unless necessary and when we do it takes a while for them to realize it. Informality is earned in. And at least in my generation we are careful of each other's space. Our sports are different. Squash. Rackets that's not racquetball. But rackets sailing. Shooting. Riding. Fly fishing. 
I don't know what size jacket I wear, if there even is a size. My favorite tuxedo is a double-breasted one that was my father's. It's quite frayed and sort of fits but is a real gem. Several of my tweeds are hand-me-downs and are obviously from another era. We make certain assumptions about other members of our clubs. Private clubs are still socially homogeneous and there really is no way that middle or working class people can participate and consequently can't learn club etiquette. Our clubs have dress codes and men wear jackets and ties in the bar and dining room and women are also properly dressed. No shorts, jeans, t-shirts, athletic shoes and above all no cell phones or business papers. A few years ago I was staying in my London club during a dreadful heat wave. Dress codes were relaxed a bit and we didn't need to wear jackets in the bar collared shirts. Tie and button sleeves were adequate. The bartender had not been advised and I entered Sans jacket and was told to leave. No photography we all value our privacy and there are often very famous people eating nearby so pictures are forbidden. There is a common thread and that's that the mannerisms are learned from an early age and are natural. Not artificial or obviously, learned. They are no better or worse than other class mannerisms. Just different. Mannerisms define and identify one's class and it's very difficult to change mannerisms. Upper class people read these cues very well and in any group or gathering we can immediately identify other members of this class regardless of the environment or the way everyone is dressed. Others can't read these cues. But if you define class by money, then all bets are off. Every social class has its characteristic habits, mannerisms, mode of behavior. These are learned from infancy and cumulatively form the mannerisms and attitudes that define social class. Because they are acquired during formative years they are strongly embedded and very difficult to change. This makes it difficult to change class. It's very hard to unlearn something. Especially a lifelong set of habits. It works both ways it's equally difficult for an upper class person to try to pass as working or middle class. I'm very much a walking social experiment. Since the age of 13. I've been at the very bottom of society. I've lived amongst people who are outsiders, disadvantaged, children of migrants who are vulnerable and don't have supportive networks. I spend much of my time around people who need social assistance and have fallen through the cracks of normal society. I have lived an adult life without the presence of family within range and have no supportive clan of my own. Up to the age of 13, I lived in a very naturally understated, casual and unconsciously upper class way. My family and relatives were informal, but posh to the core. Everything about them and how they saw the world was totally an upper-class vision. For generations this had been my family. Leaving home at a very young age. Rather they left me and moved back to the remote countryside. I was left to survive in a very poor immigrant area whereby I was supposed to distinguish myself and thrive on my own two feet. I was expected to be independent. The problem was, I had no survival tools surviving at the bottom of society. I had no aspirations to do well as a working class person or modestly middle class one. No hard grit. No aspiration or motivation to be comfortably well off. I was totally unmaterialistic. Completely indifferent to status and other things most people are very impressed by. My culture was that of a level of life most people had no clue about. It was though I came from a tribe that people had only heard about. I was a total fish out of water. I think most people who have tried to get somewhere in life see me as a dead loss maybe to the striving classes. I appear a bit simple and unaware of their accomplishments, and perhaps scorn their highly self-centered ambitions to give their children a better life so they say, in my tribal sensibilities. Conventional working class and aspirational drives seems pointless and often a waste of endeavor. Too much emphasis on material success and petty status symbols. Modern cars and clothes are ugly. Five-star holidays are tacky. Graduates that have succeeded in their educational exams are often still without gravitas. I must sound like a snob. However I'm not. What I'm deriding here is wasted energy and vain endeavors of conventional living. I'm far more impressed with a person living in a humble hovel who spends their energy looking for more meaningful and finer things of life. And not that is mass-produced and adulated by the shallow and the vain who have been shaped by social control. So, I am a case of an upper-class individual that has made my way in the world separated from my people. If I tried to go back to that world, they may not recognize me as one of their own. They may see me as, as an inner city urchin who likes football and taking walks through the market with a pair of trainers. But whatever the rejection I may receive from the upper classes, I'm sure it's not as obvious as the mismatch I get from people around me now. Thank you for listening. Did you notice any behavioral differences between people of different classes? 
Check out our other videos. Like, share and subscribe if you like the content.